Hi and welcome. Uh, my name is Madeline Lidicote and I will be your host today for a discussion uh, with Professor Michael Buzz Waitskin, who uh, is here with us to talk about um, his experiences here at Duke um, as a professor and a lecturer um, at both the law school, the Margolis Center, and um, in the Duke Initiative for Science and Society, and as the head of our Master's in Bioethics and Science Policy program uh, for the past, I think, five years or so. Um, today, um, I'm going to be leading this up. My name is Madeline Lidicote, and I am the Associate Director of Science and Society. Um, I help with our um, finances, our HR, and most importantly, our admissions to our graduate program. Uh, so I am your point of contact if you are interested in this program. And uh, today, we're going to be talking with Buzz Waitskin for about 20 minutes or so. I have a few questions to ask him that will help lead our conversation. And then I wanted to open it up to you for your questions. Um, you have the chat box there for you to use to, um, to ask us questions. And we're, of course, happy to have those. So, um, so fire away. This, this, um, this dialogue is really for you so that you um, know more about us and more about the program and that you can then assess it as, as you see fit for, for yourself. Um, so um, one thing I wanted to describe is the, is the relationship between science and society and uh, the Masters in Bioethics and Science Policy. Um, science and society is an initiative here at Duke. So an initiative is um, an, uh, an interdisciplinary space. It's like a little department. Um, where uh, we can be the intersection of, um, of various disciplines. So we're kind of at the intersection of law, science, and policy. And that's why um, we housed the Masters in Bioethics and Science Policy here. So we have staff working on, um, we have courses, we have undergraduate programs, we have this graduate program, and we have uh, staff and faculty working on um, engagement programs as well. So. Uh, think of this as kind of your home base here at Duke when you're in the program, uh, but of course um, you are a Duke graduate student as the program and so you are able to avail yourself to all the resources throughout Duke. Um, and that's, you know, quite a vast amount of resources. Um, so right now with that, I will go ahead and start introducing our guest. Um, after more than 30 years of litigation experience in Washington, D.C., Michael and Buzz is more of his, is the name that we refer to him as, Waitskin, uh, joined us as the faculty at Duke University, where he teaches courses on science, law, policy, ethics, data use, privacy, uh, federal regulation, and other issues regarding, regarding uh, science and emerging technologies. He's the deputy director of the Initiative for Science and Society and gra director of graduate studies for the Masters in Bioethics and Science Policy. He's a core member of, and faculty member of the uh, Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, and he has appointments as a se senior lecturing fellow in both the law school and science and society. And he has an adjunct faculty at the Duke Medical School. In other words, he's really busy. <laughs> he practiced, or unfocused. Or unfocused, one, yes. But he's one of those people who intersects with a <laughs> lot of different people here at Duke. So that ends up being a great resource for our students. He practiced law in the District of Columbia for 35 years, where he handled complex commercial and criminal cases in federal and state trial and appellate courts throughout the country. He has extensive experience in advising biomedical research community on issues relating to legal and regulatory strategy, product ex acquisition, exclusivity strategies, clinical research, and ethics. He also served as special counsel to the president in the White House's counsel's office. He attended the University of Virginia um, and Stanford Law School, Stanford Law School, and also Yale Law School, where he received his LLM. So I wanted to start with that, with your education and then your evolution as a professional. Buzz, um, your formal training was in law, but ha you've been able to build expertise in biomedical ethics and policy. So, what prompted that move, and how did you move, make that move in that direction? Um, well, first, let me welcome everyone mm -hmm. and thank you for your interest in joining us at Duke in the MA in Bioethics and Science Policy. Uh, my transition or the evolution of it really, Madeline, was in hindsight relatively linear. Uh, when I was in law school, I spent a lot of time dealing with issues about 
conditions in prisons and mental hospitals and juvenile court facilities. And that really dealt with the kind of broad topic of what's the relationship between the government and groups of individuals that the government decides are incapable of making their own decisions. And when I finished law school, that was in a set of issues that were really of great interest to me. And I had an opportunity to go from Stanford to Yale and became a fellow in law, science, and medicine in a program that was being funded by the Commonwealth Foundation. And we were able to consider similar issues. And informed consent was a relatively new concept at the time and was being developed a lot by the law, the Yale Law Faculty. Uh, conditions of research and what was equitable and fair and ethical research were under consideration. And so there was a logical evolution from my initial um, interest in um, law school to my graduate work in, uh, at Yale. And then when I left and went into private practice after that, because of my background and also my interest area, I was able to handle a lot of cases that le dealt with the intersection between science, policy, regulation, law, and ethics. Um, largely in the life science field, but not exclusively in the life science field. And then just to bring the story to current, um, I went to Washington with the intention of staying there five years. And one day my wife and I looked up and said, we came for five, we've been here 30, it's time to leave. And we did, and I got involved with um, a lot of consulting projects and a um, genomic diagnostic startup, which I'm still working on, uh, using some revolutionary technology involving microsatellites and short tandem or, sh or short tandem repeats, as they're also called. And then um, by one of those odd circumstances of career, um, Nita Farahani, who I had known for a long time and actually had hired as a first year law student to be a summer clerk uh, at my law firm, had become a very prominent member of the Duke Law and Philosophy faculties and a renowned scholar on issues relating to neuroscience and ethics. And she was, had moved to Duke and as part of her position at Duke was starting Science and Society. And so I had an unintended conversation with her which led to her offering me the opportunity to come to Duke to help build science and society and to teach courses here, which was impossible to turn down. Um, teaching was something I had always considered doing. And so there it was, and um, uh, I'll never forget the conversation. Uh, she m said, would you be interested in coming here? I said, are you serious? She said, I'm serious. I said, then I'm interested. And I was a Duke employee a couple months later and have now been here for five years. And together with Anita and Madeline and our exquisitely good faculty and staff, we built Science and Society. Great, great. And so now that you're here, you continue to evolve. I mean, um, you're kind of moving more into tech ethics mm -hmm. and policy. Uh, tell us about that evolution. Sure. Um, when we started the MA in Bioethics and Science Policy, we actually did a very disciplined effort to include all different kinds of stakeholders and had a lot of brainstorming sessions about whether it made sense, whether there was a need, whether it was different than what other schools were already doing. And what we discovered was that a lot of our peer institutions, Penn, Harvard, um, Emory, um, Columbia, had very good bioethics programs. But they were focused, I shouldn't say but, um, and they were focused largely, we have a train very near us, a uh, train track very near us, and the train just came through. Um, you'll get used to that when you attend classes here. Um, I don't even notice it anymore. I would, could probably sleep through it. <laughs> but in any event, what we noticed was that the, the really good programs were focusing almost exclusively on the difficult ethical choices that have to be made in the life sciences, and much of their focus was on clinical bioethics as a result, and secondly, in areas of ethics relating to research. What we realized was that almost no one, in fact, none of the other schools, were dealing with policy issues. So our perspective was, once you confront a difficult problem really raised by innovative technology, and you make the ethical choices as to what the right or wrong or what your alternative choices are to move forward, then how do you actually implement that? How do you make that happen? What are the tools that government and private industry and nonprofits have to actually bring that to realization? 
And so we realized that the real gap that was um, out there was bioethics and science policy. And so we began with a focus, a dual focus, an equal focus on ethical issues and policy issues. And um, that was where we started. And largely because of some legacy issues and my area of interest in biosciences and Nita's expertise in neuroscience, we really began focusing on the life sciences. And so we, maybe we should have called the course Bioethics and Life Science Policy, but that's where we began. And then, through a natural and frankly not conscious evolution, we began incorporating more and more innovative technologies. As big data came to the fore, and artificial intelligence began to be more available and more effective. Uh, as augmented reality um, became a tool of medical research. And, and so this began to be part of our discussion of life science, and we realized that what we were really looking at was much more not just how innovative technologies were impacting life science, but what were innovative technologies and what were the policies that needed to be carefully thought about to both input the appropriate ethical construct onto them and then figure out how to implement them. And it was, for those of you who studied bioethics at all, one of the classic presentations of a bioethical choice is the so-called trolley car dilemma, which is, your, and it has various formulations, but in its simplest form, the trolley car is rolling along the tracks, there's someone, um, a pregnant woman perhaps, in view of the, the trolley, and if you don't divert from that, you're gonna run over this woman and kill her. But if you make that choice, you're gonna kill all the passengers on the trolley car. How do you begin to make that choice? And that's often posed as the ethical construct for biomedical choices. In fact, that's much more akin to the problems that designers of, of, um, of autonomous vehicles have to make. So when you're programming the computer of a self-driving car, the computer has to make that decision. Do I run over the pedestrian or do I kill my driver? Computers don't know how to do that. Automotive engineers don't know how to do that. Bioethicists, it turns out, do know how to begin to make those choices. So it was a very natural evolution for us to move beyond life sciences into innovative technologies, whether they're autonomous vehicles or artificial intelligence or drones or a whole range of other applications of innovative technology. And so we went from this organic evolution to a much more conscious evolution, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to turn our program from ethical choices in innovative technologies broadly, both in the life science area and in the tech area. So let me just dive deeper onto a, a topic that you've been talking about a bit lately. <clears throat> Um, and that is a facial recognition. Mm -hmm. I mean, now our phones are asking us, you know, do you want to use your face instead of your, your passcode? Um, you know, all kinds of facial recognition technologies are out there. What sort of issues have you seen that we need to really be thinking about? Well, you know, our focus here at Science and Society, and I think it's really the, the core dedication of most of the faculty, is it's not just how do you evolve policy, but rather, what are the ethical foundations and the core ethical principles that you have to think about before you implement policy? And so um, the Duke is actually doing a lot of work on artificial intelligence. And there's um, the man who was recently appointed to oversee all research at Duke, both on the university side and the medical side, is also the head of a big initiative in artificial intelligence. And as part of that, he's doing a lecture series, and he asked me to do a lecture in that series many of which are very technical, and I thought for a moment, what can I add to this dialogue? And what I decided, and this is part of my law school training, but also part of our ethics training, is maybe I can pick out one application of artificial intelligence, which is relatively far evolved, and use that as a case study to consider how these technologies are evolving and how people are thinking about ethics. And for various reasons, facial recognition technology had been very much in the news. So I selected that and I spent about two months diving quite deeply um, into facial recognition and its evolution and its accuracy and what kind of problems were associated with it. And it turns out that um, facial recognition 
um, is now widely used on the commercial side. For example, you can look at your phone, you can look at your doorbell, and you can gain access to things, which is a relatively complex but more straightforward is can you confirm that a person is who they claim to be? And as you think about that, so it's a relatively simpler problem to take a known individual with a very good photograph and say, yes, this is or isn't this person, and therefore you're allowed to do the following. The more complicated application of facial recognition technology turned out to be, can you scan a crowd of protesters? Or can you scan a crowd in a stadium and identify particular individuals that are of interest? Known terrorists, political dissidents, how can you do that? And it turns out that that technology evolved very far. And as I began to look into it, the Chinese, for example, are using the combination of big data and facial recognition um, software as an incredibly powerful tool of political repression. They have basically segregated out the Uyghur population, which are the minority Muslim population in China, imprisoned them in camps, tracked their every movement using these technologies. So I was able to take the facial recognition technology from this relatively benign application about can I use this to turn on my phone rather than the button or a series of numbers or my fingerprint into this horrific series of applications that were being used in China. And having made this presentation and mostly addressing a group of young scientists, I put the question to them. What were the developers of facial recognition thinking when they originally developed the facial recognition technology? Did they envision this potential horrible application of political repression? If they didn't think of it, why didn't they think of it? Did they think of it because they didn't bother to think about it, because they thought about it and were afraid that if they mentioned it, it would repress their ability to get funds for their research? Did they realize it? Did they not care? And what I tried to imbue in these young scientists and in the policy people that were there is how do we begin thinking about really powerful technologies at their birth? And what are the obligations of the scientists who are developing them to whether they move forward or not? And how do you raise those questions? And should you raise those questions? And somebody asked me at one point how the talk went. And I said, I have to tell you, half the people in the room were incredibly uncomfortable about the conversation. They didn't want to have to have it. And I see our obligation as sci at science and society is to make people have those conversations. Because with, artificial, with facial recognition, it's too late. The technology is well developed, it's disseminated around the world, it's widely used, sadly, by a series of repressive regimes for similar purposes to what's going on in China, and it's too late. But as a case study, I think it was a very powerful example of the way we need to think about all innovative technologies, whether it's gene editing or whether it's artificial intelligence. It doesn't only apply to life sciences, it also applies to other technologies. Yeah. Yeah, maybe right. a longer answer than you were looking for. No, no, no. That's exactly um, the point. Is you know really so? How do we? How do we? And sort of giving the students frameworks for uh, the, the next big thing. How do they? How should we be thinking about something before it gets uh, is used in all these different situations? Yeah. And this is a bit of an oversimplification because there are clearly core principles of bioethics. Um, which frankly don't only, they're labeled bioethics, which would lead one to believe they only relate to life sciences. But the core principles of bioethics are the respect of individuals' autonomy, both in protecting their body and in their decision making, um, principles of justice, principles of beneficence, principles of non malevolence. Those things don't only apply to life sciences, they just happen to have been clustered around and made into a discipline called bioethics but they apply with equal strength to a decision about drone technology mm -hmm. um, or facial recognition or using artificial intelligence in the criminal justice system or gene, gene editing or gene drives or a whole series or these amazing innovations that are being made in neuroethics. All of these innovative technologies share the capacity to do incredible good, but they also may have underlying dangers. And so the real challenge of both policymakers and ethicists, which we hope we're training, is that at the beginning, they ask the questions. You have to start with the questions. If you don't ask the right questions, you can't begin thinking about what principles apply. If you ignore the questions, which is convenient and comfortable and maybe lucrative, you end up very much downstream with a society that you 
didn't want to have. Right, right. And so then you take it the next step, which is the uh, writing, uh, coming up with solutions. And so tell me how that in your classes do you discuss this, or in the SciReg lab? Do, how do you how do you help students with the formulation um, mm -hmm. of uh, and conceptualization of policy uh, proposals, or even you know amendments to existing policies? Right. In addition to um, being the director of graduate studies um, for the master's program, which means I spend a lot of time with all of the students talking about what their individualized goals and objectives are. And we do try and make it an individualized program. Um, I teach one of our core courses, which is called Science Law and Policy. We have um, three, we've had three, and it's probably a good point to talk a little bit about where we're evolving here, or another way in which we're evolving, which is we had in the past four core courses, really. We had Science Law and Policy, which I teach, which relates to how policy, whether life science or otherwise, is regulated and controlled by both government and private parties and nonprofits. Um, research bioethics, which deals with questions relating to what's the ethical conduct of research and how do you make choices about informed consent and research on vulnerable populations and equitable issues about research and, and so forth. Then clinical bioethics, which is um, the traditional, one of the most traditional approaches to bioethics, which is how do you make various decisions within the medical setting, within the clinical setting. And we teach that has, has been one of our core courses since we started, which is taught by a member of the medical school faculty. And then we have another required course, which is a, we call it the colloquium, but what it really is, it goes over two semesters and it's two skill sets. One is about writing and one is about speaking. So the first half is how do you write effectively and clearly uh, about science to audiences that are not technically trained or to audiences that are technically trained but without them feeling like you're dumbing down their science. So the first half is about writing and then the second half is about science communication. How do you talk to people about science in ways that they can understand it? How do you communicate with people who aren't certain they believe that vaccinations are a good public policy? How do you deal with people who are uncertain about the realities of the science underlying climate change? So those have been our core courses, and then beyond that, we have electives. One of the things that we've done um, in recognition of the fact that a lot of our students are coming in now and are much more focused on innovative technology rather than life science innovative technology, um, we've split the course. So everyone now will take science law and policy. They'll also take research bioethics and we're expanding the case studies and examples we're using in those two courses to include not only life science situations, but for example, in my science law and policy class, we, we spend a lot of time talking about assisted suicide. We also spend a lot of time talking about drones and autonomous vehicles and big data and other tech-related issues, and similarly in the research bioethics course. And what we've set up is we knew ha have a new course now um, taught by a new member of the faculty who came to us from the policy shop at Facebook, which is the ethical foundations of innovative technology. And it's much more focused away from the life science into a tech ethics course and we continue to teach clinical bioethics, so our students are able then to branch and either focus largely on life science and clinical bioethics or go into the tech ethics area. And then their, collect their, their um, electives, which they select, and Madeline mentioned, from across the availability in all of the schools at Duke, um, will really focus them in either a tech area or a life science area, depending upon what they're interested in. So back to my course. Um, I use, uh, again, it's my legal training and my ethics training. I use a lot of case studies. And what we do is we talk about um, what the relationship between the federal government is and the state government in terms of which entity controls certain areas of scientific research. Mm -hmm. We talk about all the tools that government has at its disposal to either incentivize or discourage certain kinds of scientific practices whether those have to do with tax incentives or funding or regulation or transparency. There are a really fairly broad toolkit that the government and nonprofits and industry have to affect the direction in which science is developed and applied. And so that's what we study in my course, Science Law and Policy. 
And then the research bioethics, as I described, also begins to focus broadly across the disciplines. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, yeah, get a good drink of water. Yeah. You've been talking uh, quite a bit. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you also about is kind of um, the way students at Duke are getting involved in real science regulation. You run a lab called SciReg Lab. Right. A, creatively, and, um, and, and, and you really start talking and getting involved in, in active policy that, are, that is being uh, in, in instituted in our government right now or in our regulatory agencies. Um, tell us how that um, helps, is part of the curriculum and what, what happens there. Well, first let me start, I don't know whether I should apologize for or just announce that there's a great tendency to shorten everything. <laughs> so it's Sci this, it's Sci that, it's SciCom, which is science communication, it's SciPol, which is science policy. Um, and in my particular case, I run um, my other course that I teach for science and society is the Science Regulation Lab, or of course, SciReg Lab. And so what we do, some of you may be familiar with it, it may be completely new to all of you, but despite what the rhetoric about the efforts to reduce the administrative state in the political discourse, in fact, government federal regulation is very um, uh, uh, frequent, it's broad, um, it's intense, it's continuous. And the way federal regulations are promulgated is there's a process called notice and comment rulemaking. So when the government, one of the agencies of the government, whether it's the Environmental Protection Agency or the Food and Drug Administration or the Council of Environmental Quality or, the, or NASA or wherever it happens to be, wants to put forward a new regulatory structure about a topic. They submit it in as a proposed rule into something called notice and comment rulemaking, which is remarkably democratic. Anyone can comment into the notice and comment rulemaking. And so what we do in class is I actually get my students to read the Federal Register, which is the document the government produces every morning, announces all the new proposed rules, all the executive orders, um, notices of public meetings and so forth. They read them and we identify particular areas of interest to the students that touch on or at their core involve issues of technology and science. And then we actually file comments into the rulemaking process on those topics. And the course is interdisciplinary. Um, it's made up, it's small. Um, we're, our first class um, of this semester is tomorrow. We have 13 students and they come either from our MA in bioethics program, they come from PhD, they're PhD students in STEM disciplines, whether biomedical research or cell biology or immunology or environmental science or computer science, and then um, law students. And so the students work in interdisciplinary teams with the lawyers, the ethicists, um, and the scientists all working together trying to craft a document which is comprehensible and understandable to all of them, which is a significant challenge, um, but one they learn about. And it not only simulates, but it actually replicates the real world experience they will have, particularly for the law students who are going out into law firms for regulatory practice. This is what they'll be doing. They'll be working with expert witnesses to try and craft appropriate comments. So to, just to give you a sense of the range of topics that we dealt with, last year we filed nine different comments to nine different rules, and one had to do with orbital space debris, which the Federal Communications Commission was concerned about because of all the communication satellites. We filed one regarding drones, we filed another regarding autonomous vehicles, one regarding blockchain and Bitcoin, another regarding how pain should be dealt with in social security disability decisions, another having to do with um, sunscreen and what SPS really meant and what the environmental impacts of sunscreens are, mercury emission from coal plants. So there was a wide range and what we do is we, the students divide into teams by their expressed interest and then we identify a subject matter expert either from within the Duke faculty or outside of Duke if we don't have anybody here who knows what they're doing and then they work together to craft the rules which have something like a 30, 60, 90 day window of opportunity to file. And so this is the fourth year in which we're doing it and we're now exploring the possibility of scaling it up so that it would become an ongoing center um, at Duke where we'd be looking at all of the regulations that relate to science, engaging far more faculty, far more students. So we've got a small grant from the provost's office 
here at Science and Society to explore those possibilities. Sounds great. I mean, whether a student t takes on uh, this as a career or whether this is uh, just a great way to become a more informed participant in our society, it's a great, it's a great bridge, uh, for, for especially for the PhD students. Yeah, I think, mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. Because I mean, the reality is many of the PhD students won't get academic jobs anymore. So they need to begin thinking about alternative careers. Um, and for many of them, they don't want academic jobs. They really want alternative careers. And one of the most valuable alternative careers for somebody who's trained in a scientific discipline is to go into policy and to help develop, whether it's through the federal government, through a trade association, through corporations, to contribute to the efforts to decide how to define and regulate these new and evolving technologies. And so for them to, to, to know that the Federal Register exists, for example, or that there is such a thing as notice and comment rulemaking, or that there's an opportunity for them to participate in this process <coughs> is an em enormous conceptual breakthrough for many of them and very valuable. And for the law students to understand that they can't do this on their own. They need real technical scientific expertise and they need to learn how to work with those folks this is their first opportunity to do it. So it has a real life experience positive benefit, yeah. I think. No, I teach the course, so I'm biased, but <laughs> that's, well, what, that's what most of the students say also. And, and you know, this, so this whole program sounds like it, it, it tends to be, have a real practical bent to it, which is amplified in the practicum. Uh, the practicum is the last semester of a person's, uh, you know, uh, tour here. For their, for their MA. And so can you tell us a little bit about um, how, students, uh, how students are advised to go about see seeking out a practicum placement and mm -hmm. some, some um, interesting ideas about what people have chosen? Sure. Um, the one um, course requirement that I, uh, or degree requirement that I didn't talk about in my earlier summary is that all of our students spend, this, most of them during the summer, sometimes during the year, but mostly in the summer, um, spend um, the entirety of that period of time either immersed in an entity that's engaged in science policy and ethics, whether that's a governmental agency, a corporation, a nonprofit, an academic research endeavor, whatever it happens to be, and they immerse themselves in that placement. And we, they each will have a local project sponsor and a Duke faculty sponsor we create a series of dialogues with their faculty sponsor through a series of reflections so that we understand where they're going and the kinds of issues they're confronting. And they create a work product which then is used as a basis to every student and the graduate school has to pass an MA final committee, which is a committee of three faculty members. So based on their practicum experience, they make a presentation to the three faculty members and that's part of their graduation requirements. And so the idea is, and I know this is sometimes frustrating for students, because the undergraduate experience usually says, these are the things I have to do, as opposed to these are the things I want to do, or this is where I really want to move creatively. Um, the practicum opportunities are really broad and wide. And we really want our students to think about what kind of experience will help prepare them for the next aspect of their career. Are they interested in data? Are they interested in biomedical research? Are they interested in pharma? Are they interested in international global health kinds of issues? And there are opportunities to do all those things. So let me just give you some examples of what our students did last summer. Um, one of our students was really interested in children's mental health issues and immigration and how immigration issues impact the mental health of children. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up finding a program that was sponsored by Columbia University in conjunction with the University of Indonesia in Jakarta that was studying what the impact was on orphan children um, and the mental health of orphan children as a result of various social and physical disruptions in Indonesia. And so our student went over there and worked with that group for the summer to understand how those issues were impacting on these children and came back and made just this remarkably moving presentation about her experiences there. Another student was interested in Madagascar and it turns out Duke 
um, a little known fact, has the largest lemur collection in the world outside of Madagascar, and there's a lot of connections between um, the um, biological departments here and Madagascar, and there was an opportunity to go to Madagascar to determine how healthcare was being disseminated to farmers. Um, and so she had an opportunity to do that. So she literally was in place for the summer in a series of small communities in Madagascar. And it had to do with the chocolate crop. Um, and so all of the cocoa farmers and how they were getting their health care and the cooperatives that was set up and the interaction between the economy and their health care and the provision of health care and the availability of health care. So she was really able to see how health care is delivered in a completely different setting. On the other side of the world, literally, another of our students was much more interested in thinking about the future and futurism and the world economy. And so he went to the World Economic Forum um, where they, I think, coined the term the fourth industrial revolution. And he spent his time thinking big thoughts in San Francisco with all the big thinkers um, and doing a project, um, uh, one of which was ha had to do with what would be the consequences of delivering um, internet services and um, electronic phone services to a country like Rwanda. Um, and, and he ended up working, um, getting a job there and working there. Another student was interested in big data and we got him a placement at Intel uh, in Oregon and he spent the summer thinking about how Intel, which is of course a primarily a chip manufacturer, should begin thinking about policies relating to ethical and policy structures around artificial intelligence. Um, another one of our students um, who was, I didn't quite understand her geographical predisposition at first, and then I learned that she was engaged um, to somebody who was posted at Fort Bragg. Um, she wanted to go to an army hospital to do her practicum. And so we ended up getting her posted at Fort Bragg, which is, I believe, the largest military institution installation in the world. And there's a hospital, Womack Hospital there, which services all of the servicemen and their families. And so she did two projects there, one of which had to do, there's something you'll learn about in research bioethics, which is there's a new set of federal rules about how um, medical research needs to be conducted. And so she did a project on how these new rules should be adapted to um, an army medical facility which conducts research in a different way. And her other project was, we have all read a lot about um, CTE or um, chronic traumatic encephalitis uh, and encephalopathy, which we talk about with football players and head injuries. As you can imagine, the military has a much more significant problem with head injuries, not to diminish football, but the frequency of head injuries of people that are jumping out of airplanes and are in combat is much more frequent and severe than even among the football players. And there was a huge study um, within the military to begin to explore how to protect our um, service people in those settings that she worked on. So there are a whole range, another student was really interested in autonomous vehicles. And so she ended up working with this new coalition organization of government agencies, manufacturers, and nonprofits to begin developing standards around autonomous vehicles. So our students are all over the place, literally and figuratively, in terms of the subject matter of their practicums, the location of their practicums, and, this, and the types of projects they end up doing. Great. It sounds like it's a, a really um, customized program where people then can also translate their experiences both in classes and especially in their practicum to a career. They don't have to go on to law school or medical school. They often can just on-ramp right into a career after this. That's exactly right. So whether your intention coming into the program is to position yourself and position this as a terminal degree that will lead to employment, that works for many of our students. Others of our students use this as a, a gap year or a transition from undergraduate school into either medical school or law school, or many of them a PhD program. Um, I think this year, two of our students, one went into a PhD degree in pharmaceutical medicine, another's going into a PhD program in philosophy. So it's a great stepping stone to 
um, uh, a different academic career. Other people go and work in government agencies. We've had a number of students who've gone off to work at the National Institutes of Health, other governmental agencies. Um, so it's, it's both an opportunity for employment, but also the next step in people's academic career. And frankly, we also get a lot of students who love the subject matter and don't know where they want to go. And this seems like the perfect way to think through uh, what their next steps in their education and career are, and we welcome them. Um, it's a small program. Um, we try and limit the size of the class to 15. Um, and so there's a lot of attention paid to try and create a program that really works well for the students. Great. Well, thanks, Buzz, for all your great comments and everything. My um, pleasure. Yeah, it really has been really enlightening and, and a great opportunity to hear these stories. Now, if anybody has any questions for us, let us know. Uh, you can type in your um, chat box and we can, uh, we can see um, any of your questions. I seem to have one here that I can't read all the way. Let me go up and see. see. Oh, great. Uh, oh, this is a private comment, so we won't read it out loud. <laughs> we'll read do it. Do you think that Duke's additional focus on policy opens up more opportunities for careers afterwards? And is it common for students to do, oh, is it common for students to already know what they want to do with their career after this program? Well, yes, um, to both. Uh, the the opportunity to study ethics and policy is, as I said earlier, relatively unique. And without proselytizing, it's very difficult to develop policy without a strong ethics underpinning. Because as I, I suggested with my example of facial recognition, is there are deeply embedded ethical issues in all of these developing technologies. And if you're not self-consciously focused upon that aspect of your analysis, you'll miss it, and then the world will pass us by, we'll develop technologies, and we'll look back and say, gosh, if we'd only thought about that before, we may have been able to prevent these horrible outcomes. Um, and so the ability to go into a policy setting with the ethics background, I think, is really strong. The ethics alone is not enough for a lot of the policy jobs that people would be interested in, to be able to talk about how ethical issues apply across a wide range of technologies, I think gives our, our students a real opportunity and a real credential that is, is rather unique. Yeah, and it sounds like this student is also really interested in science communication. Um, your courses that make the information more accessible through effective communication, writing and speaking, is outstanding. Um, and so can you comment a little bit more on SciComm? And, yeah, sure. we really haven't talked about that. But one thing I am thinking about doing is having a SciComm specific webinar. So I will definitely keep you apprised of that so we can hear from our faculty who specifically focus on that. You know, one of the unfortunate aspects of the polarization that we're experiencing broadly in society is the difficulty of persuading people to reevaluate their opinions. What's happening increasingly is people look to thought leaders that they align themselves with, whether it's in a political party or a religious group or whatever it ha happens to be, and whatever the, the doctrine is of that organization they subscribe to and don't want to be dislodged from. So, so many of the challenges that we have in society, whether it deals with climate change or vaccinations <laughs> or sexually transmitted diseases or vaping or coal mountaintop coal mining or whatever it happens to be, have a very important underlying scientific basis. And to figure out how to talk effectively with people who are not disposed to listen and who don't have any technical background, but to gain their attention, gain their respect, um, and allow them to begin thinking about these questions in a way that really corresponds to their own personal values rather than in a way that someone else may have suggested to them was the best way to address the policy. So we do have a huge emphasis within our curriculum on science communication and our colloquium course that I suggested earlier is all about science communication. It's about learning how to write effectively about science for scientific and non-scientific audiences and it's also about figuring out how to talk to people about science who are not in science audiences. So for example, 
and the oral science communications component of that, people learn how to give TED Talks. Um, they learn how to give elevator speeches. We have a simulated cocktail party at the end of the course, as I think the last class, which everybody seems to love, where we recruit a bunch of faculty and staff from Duke who pretend to be senators or CEOs or other people at a cocktail party with the students, and they engage the students, and in, the, in the, a period of 30 or 45 seconds, the students have to explain what their research project is about, which is not only comprehensible, but interesting and engaging to this person and wants them to say more than, I think I better go talk to somebody else. Um, so learning those skills is really very much part of what we do. It's part of the structured curriculum and it's very much part of the engagement curriculum. Yeah, I remember I learned a, a lot, a, a great appreciation about snakes in one of my uh, SciComm 45 second interviews. So yeah, it was, it's great. Um, if, there are, if there are any more questions, let me know. Um, you can always send emails to me, um, which is madeline.litticote at duke.edu. Um, you're, you're receiving emails from me, so you should have that e email address. Um, I can direct them to Buzz if, if, if he's the, the better authority on these, which he probably is. Um, and if you don't have any other questions today, I appreciate your coming, and um, we look forward to receiving your application. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us at, uh, this afternoon. And as Madeline says, we're happy to answer any questions, and hopefully we look forward to seeing you in the fall.